Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is Lecture 3B, where we're going to talk about protein folding and function. We'll talk about how proteins fold into complex functional structures with what biochemists distinguish as four different levels of structure. Um, we'll talk about proteins whose job is to help keep proteins out of trouble while they're still sort of new and haven't yet achieved their proper folded structure. And we'll talk about the roles of proteins in the cell. On the right here is a simulated protein. It's a very short peptide. You can see these are different side chains along the chain. And this is an animation simulating the actual protein, folding of the protein. And you'll see there's a lot of random motion driven by random thermal energy in the cell that eventually brings compatible parts of the protein chain together to fold. Two points about what makes parts of the protein compatible. Some parts of the protein, some amino acid side chains, have the property of being hydrophilic. They like water. And this causes them to stay on the outside of the folded protein, where they can interact with the water molecules in the aqueous environment of the cell cytoplasm. Other side chains are hydrophobic. They avoid water, and they tend to fold into structures where they're together, sheltered from the water on the outside of the cell. So they tend to be on the inside of the folded protein. Now that's a very oversimplification, but it's a fundamental principle nevertheless. Now, biochemists distinguish four levels of folding in proteins, although two of them aren't really folding at all. The first level, which isn't really folding at all, is just the sequence of the amino acids in the protein, back in the protein chain. The second level is a kind of local folding um, which actually is easier to understand if we look at it in um, the third structure. So here's a segment where part of the protein has formed a structure called an alpha helix. And this is driven largely by just the structure of the backbone. It's partially independent of the properties of the particular amino acid side chains. Here's a different kind of local structure called a beta sheet. Here's a part of that protein that has folded into a beta sheet. The third level of structure, which is really the main sequence-driven level of structure, is the complex folding of the protein back onto itself in many different ways, so that all of these different parts of the protein are interacting with each other by various chemical interactions, usually not covalent interactions, um, ionic interactions, hydrophobic and hydrophilic interactions, um, that fold the protein into its particular shape. The fourth level, which again is not really folding, is the assembly of different protein subunits, the, pro the products of different genes, into a larger sort of megaprotein which consists of different subunits from different genes. You encountered an example of this, although you might not have realized it, in the last molecule, last module when we talked about um, the glow, alpha globin and beta globin genes. These are genes on different chromosomes. They code for related but different proteins. But the two proteins, the alpha and the beta globin, assemble together into the four-part protein called hemoglobin, which actually carries the oxygen in our blood. Now, for protein folding, is it's like folding a map. There's a lot more ways to do it wrong than there are ways to do it right. And the larger a protein is, the longer the primary sequence is, the more likely the protein is to run into trouble during the folding process. Because most proteins are much more complex than that simple one in the animation. And so cells have special other proteins, kind of like metaproteins, whose job is to help proteins fold up. And these proteins are called, cleverly, chaperonins. Um, here's an example of a chaperonin complex. It's actually made of 
many chaperone and subunits. Here's what it looks like seen from the end. It's sort of a hollow bag in which proteins, young new proteins that haven't yet achieved their mature structure, have a sheltered environment where they can um, explore interactions while the, the chaperone, it's really like a chaperone at a party, the chaperone proteins sort of promote appropriate interactions and gently discourage inappropriate interactions. So here's a question for you. How come proteins can fold up so many different ways when different DNAs always form the same double helix? And this time we've written the answers out here because they were too long to fit in the Coursera template. And there's two right answers. Um, first, the side chains of amino acids are much more variable than bases. Not only are there 20 different side chains, but the side chains of amino acids show much more dramatic differences in structure. Even though they're smaller than the bases, the bases really only come in two types, whereas side chains of amino acids come in many different types with many different chemical properties. The other reason is that amino acid side chains can have many different interactions. They're not constrained with just pairing with one partner. Even different parts of the same amino acid side chain can interact with different parts of the protein. Now, the phosphodiester bonds of DNA aren't actually stiffer than peptide bonds, although when they're twisted up into a double helix, they are stiffer. Um, and protein synthesis, you should remember from module one, does use base pairing. It's the base pairing between the transfer RNA and the messenger RNA codons that actually puts the right amino acids in the right order in the protein. Now, here's some examples of protein structures, um, starting with a quite a simple little protein called partin. Even this is, oh, probably 10 times more complicated than the protein in the animation. Um, mutations in Parkin cause Parkinson's disease. That's how it's got its name. Green fluorescent protein actually comes from a jellyfish, but it turned out to be extraordinarily useful for studying cell structure because you can genetically engineer it as a tag on other proteins so they fluorescent show green fluorescent light when you shine a UV lamp on them. And now we have a whole suite of rainbow of fluorescent proteins derived from this protein. This is a protein that binds influenza virus. You'll see here, let me just point out some structures. This is alpha helix, this coil. This is beta sheets. They're sort of lying down on top of each other. This is what's called a barrel formed by a whole tube of beta sheets wrapped around each other, or wrapped around a central core. The IFIT protein, which binds to influenza virus RNA, consists almost entirely of alpha helix. And catalase, I mean, this is a complicated protein. It's got four identical subunits, I'll, so I can't really circle them because each, this, each subunit is entangled with the others, making many interactions. So the, the sort of turquoisey subunit, these are identical, they're colored differently so you can see what they're doing. You'll see that most of the, this aqua subunit is in this region here, but the parts of it are over here interacting with the blue subunit and here. And here's a part of it way down here that's interacting with the purple subunit and the red subunit and the blue subunit. All of these interactions hold these subunits together into their assembled form which allows catalase to function. Catalase is a very important enzyme because we think of hydrogen peroxide as something you might buy to dye your hair or disinfect something. But in fact, it's produced in large amounts by the reactions in all our cells, and it's quite a toxic molecule. So all of our cells have catalase running around, breaking down the hydrogen peroxide as quickly as it forms, so the peroxide doesn't damage other proteins, and most importantly, doesn't damage our DNA. Now, proteins 
as you'll see from the upcoming lectures, the next oh, five or six lectures are about protein functions. There's a lot of different kinds of functions. Many proteins are catalytic. They're what we call enzymes. Um, a number of proteins have structural functions. For instance, here is the um, actin and myosin subunits of our muscles, and these proteins are able to slide across each other, forming the shortening and lengthening the muscle. That's how muscle contracts. This is, in a sense, both catalytic, because there's enzyme catalysis bringing about this movement, and structural, because these proteins are actually the physical structure of our muscles. Proteins also function in transport, in moving molecules in and out of cells and around in our bodies. And of course, we've already talked quite a bit about how proteins can function in regulation, especially by recognizing and binding to particular DNA sequences. Now, what we've done, we talked about how protein folding depends on random motions of the protein bringing together parts of the protein chain that can form stable interactions. This folding is assisted by special proteins called molecular chaperones that help make sure that the right interactions form so the protein folds in the right way. We looked at some protein structures, different levels of protein structure, and we talked briefly about the different kinds of protein functions, which we're going to talk about in detail in the next lectures. Coming up next, we're going to talk about catalytic proteins, about enzymes, and how to think about their effects on phenotype. I hope to see you there.